The COVID-19 pandemic may have started out as a health crisis, but its disruptive power is fanning the flames of a cascade of other crises that have been developing in the months and years beforehand, geopolitical, economic and social. Well, the European Union was a slow first responder to the epidemic, but now is trying to drive the global response entangled in a bitter feud between Beijing and Washington. Well, Joseph Beret is the EU's foreign policy affairs chief and he joins me now. Good afternoon to you. Thank you very much for joining us on the Global Conversation. Now let's begin straight away with the issue that's on everybody's minds and this would be the coronavirus of course and does the EU have any evidence at all that COVID-19 originated in a lab in Wuhan, China? It seems that uh, it was originated there by the news that everybody have. It seems that it was originated there, but uh, from a scientific point of view, uh, I don't have any kind of uh, proof of how and when and where it happened. So would you be saying that it originated in China or the Wuhan lab? I don't have the... I don't have uh, information to answer your question. I don't know if it was originated in a lab, in a market, or in a natural way, or, or not. I know that there is a controversy between the China and the United States about the origin of the virus. And uh, frankly speaking, I think that uh, we from Europe, we don't have to feed this controversy and to require scientific approaches in order to understand better the origin and to be able to prevent uh, the next pandemic, that this is not going to be the last one. And in order to do so, the EU is tabling a resolution that will be put forward to the World Health Organization calling for an independent investigation. Now, the origins of this virus, as you say, are very important. China is very sensitive to that. So will the wording include issues relating to the origins of the virus? We want, I think we need uh, a scientific, independent approach not to blame, but to know, to understand, to, to be able to better know how things can happen, how things has happened, mainly in order to prevent another case like this. But uh, the precise terms of the draft, I cannot tell you because the work is not finished. Do you think China will ever allow an independent investigation into the origins of this virus? Well, I think everybody has the same interest of understanding which has been the causes. And I'm sure that uh, the same interest on understanding scientifically in order to prevent another pandemia will be shared by everybody. This thing has become a matter of um, controversy and it's going to poison the relationship between China and the United States. I think we have to conduct it to a rational, logical and scientific approach. Uh, poison the relationship between China and the United States, but what about China and the EU? Because you have also admitted that you've been under pressure from China uh, to dilute texts when it comes to disinformation. Uh, also in terms of a communique, an opinion piece by 27 of your EU ambassadors, when the wording of the origins of this virus was actually removed by Chinese state censuses. So would you say that your relationship between between yourselves and China is one based on respect and trust. We have a, a positive relation with China and, and my work is to try to keep this relation. China is a power from many points of view. We have a complex relation because it's a multi-dimensional approach from a competitor, from economic terms, in the logical terms. It's a different political system, so there is a systemic rival, but at the same time we have a important approaches in some issues like climate change, multilateralism, and we have a strong economic and commercial and trade relation with China. So we have to approach China from different point of views. But it doesn't prevent us from saying what we have to say. 
So and, what do you uh, have to say then when it comes also, to disinformation? Uh, what do you have to say to China when it comes to its campaign of disinformation and withholding information when it has come to this pandemic? What we have to say is what we have said in the report that you know because it has been made public and there we list a certain um, events, issues, uh, certain information that we consider be part of this information and we have published a report uh, on that, not uh, hiding anything. And I think it's an important position which uh, puts uh, on the ground the disinformation problems that we are facing, not just coming from China, from Russia, or from many other sources that we cannot identify the origin. But today we are suffering a real infodemic, a real amount of information which is uh, confusing people and require a big effort for us to explain with the, the, the way things are. Well, you've described China as a systemic rival. You've also now just you know, talked about openly the disinformation campaigns that China has exerted on Europe. So how can China be a trusted partner? Well, I am not calling China a systemic rival today. It was written on the strategic report that the European Union delivered on last year. So there is nothing new on that. And I said that uh, it's considered not only a systemic rival, but also an important partner, a competitor, uh, uh, but a do you trade trust each uh, But do you trust Beijing? There are many, many different things. Can I, can I finish my answer, if you don't mind? Mm -hmm. Can I finish my answer? So don't look at China just on a unilateral approach, because I, as I said, it's a complex relationship. Okay, so then I'll ask my question again. It's a complex relationship, but this is a simple question. Do you trust Beijing? Well, you know, in the, in the diplomatic relations, it's uh, usual that uh, the powers put pressure using the diplomatic channels. When someone is not happy, they tell us. We do the same thing. The important thing is not to receive pressure, but how do you react to the pressures? And how do you react to the pressure? Have you given in to Chinese pressure at all? No, in the case you were talking about the information produced by my services here, not at all. We continue saying exactly the same thing that we was content on the working report that we have been using on an internal activity and just have a look at that and you will see. But why then would a whistleblower actually feel it necessary to call out the activities of your services? Yes, I think we have been doing the necessary, but maybe it has been not enough. In what respect? You know, the way my services work internally as in, is an internal issue. OK, but my, my question was, why would a, ch a whistleblower within your services feel it necessary to call out the fact that they felt that you were diluting your responses to Chinese disinformation? I think that about this issue, I already said what they have to say. OK, well, let's move along then and let's look at the relationship between uh, your services, you as foreign policy chief for the EU and Donald Trump, because you've been quite open about this and you've said it's a difficult relationship to handle that has to be handled with care. So what's it like dealing with Donald Trump? How complex is that relationship? Well, you know, uh, our relationship with uh, Donald Trump, we don't have a relation with Donald Trump. We have a relation with the United States is an interinstitutional relationship, not a personal one. And everybody knows that uh, between the states and Europe today there are disagreements. And uh, we receive from the United States some remarks that uh, we don't like or we don't agree, but it is uh, the way it is. And we try to build a positive relation in spite of some differences and disagreements. Now, as the US disengages, this could be the EU's moment to step in, but it hasn't. The world order was very much damaged before the pandemic. The multilateralism was um, in difficulties, mainly because the United States were withdrawing from the multilateral, multilateral approach to the world problems. 
But it's clear that the world order today it's not order, it's no longer according with the real distribution of power, which is very much different from the distribution of power at the end of the Second World War that was when the order with the United States taking the leadership was born. And uh, I think that uh, we live in a disordered world and we need to rebuild a new multilateralism in which uh, the European Union can play an important role. But this would be the EU's moment to start playing that role, but it seems to be on the back foot. Why is that? Well, it's your opinion. So, in your opinion, is the EU making its voice heard sufficiently? Is it having the economic, geopolitical clout that you would like it to have Europe in a stronger world as your mandate dictates? Well, the European Union is uh, what it is, is not a state, but uh, is playing an important role in facing the coronavirus, helping our partners in Africa, in Latin America, with all our resources. Yesterday we hold a pledging conference and we got uh, almost $8,000 million dollars to finance the research for a pandemic, the European Union is playing an important geopolitical role as a soft power. We have a, yesterday a meeting with the Balkans, two weeks ago with the Sahelian countries. Our missions stay in the ground in spite of the problems of the coronavirus. We do what we can do, being what we are. And power, which is not a military power, but it has a lot of influence in the world. And I think that our contribution as a geopolitical actor to face pandemics is the most important one. No one has been contributing as much as us to the fight against the pandemic worldwide. If Europe is to maintain influence abroad, it does need unity back home. Now, I'd like to touch on a number of issues relating to the internally to the EU. Uh, first of all, uh, the ruling by Germany's constitutional court, which would say that its decisions supersede those of EU institutions. Now, this is potentially explosive, is it not? This decision pertained to former stimulus packages. But as the EU is in crisis mode, looking to create further stimulus to bring North and South together, this decision could open wounds and create yet further division. Well, the, the decision of the German Constitutional Court has to be respected as we respect uh, all decisions coming from judiciaries in democratic countries, but uh, it doesn't prevent us to disagree. And certainly this, uh, this uh, decision of the Constitutional Court in Germany opens questions about the role of the European Central Bank. The only thing I can say is that we stick uh, firmly supporting the independence of the European Central Bank and the preeminency of the European law and European judiciary institutions. So potentially setting you on a collision course with Germany's constitutional court, its legal decisions? Certainly. Uh, this uh, sentence of the constitutional court poses a problem that will be We'll have to deal with it. As the pandemic hit Europe, solidarity did seem in a short supply. Now, EU hasn't got the competence for health, but this pandemic has really raised that question that whether the EU should be able to supersede sovereign states in terms of public health. Would this be something you would support? <sighs> Well, that's true. The pandemic puts the question of the best way of organizing the public services of uh, health. Health has become a matter of security. Internally and externally, health is 
it's a problem of uh, when we talk about security and defense uh, among security you have to include now health health is not just a matter of how do you manage the hospital of your village it's not just a matter that can be dealt with uh, inside uh, the borders of a country a pandemic doesn't know borders so maybe it would be good to think about what kind of an answer the European Union as a whole have to be able to give in the future. Uh, coordination can be a way, uh, stockpiling critical resources at the European level can be another way, because if we have to, to have stocks of security, it doesn't make sense that every country has its own stock. You can have an European stock and it would be much better for everything. But this is something that has to be discussed. But by the time being, opinion, I think that uh, there is a growing feeling. Does the EU need new powers when it comes to health? You mean new competences, not new powers. New competences, then? New competence. OK, that's better. New competences. Um, it would not be a bad idea, but it depends on which competences. This has to be discussed among member states. And to give more competences to the European Union would require a modification of the treaties, which is uh, something that is not in the agenda. But maybe member states can agree on giving the European Union a more important role on coordinating their competences. That, for example, what we are doing here at the External Service and uh, with the ministers of defense trying to coordinate what the military of each country can do in order to help to face the pandemic and acting in a coordinated way, uh, also with the NATO. And moving on to another issue now briefly, uh, Mr. Beret, one of the other casualties of this crisis has been democracy. Now, after COVID-19, Freedom House has downgraded Hungary and doesn't even consider Hungary as a democracy anymore. And it fears Poland could go the same way too. Do you admit that the EU has failed when it comes to upholding the principles of democracy within its member states? I'm sorry to say, but you have a, a vision of the world which is a little bit dramatic. Huh? I don't share your opinion that democracy has been a victim of the pandemic. I live in a democratic country as well today as yesterday, and this happens for all Europeans. I can understand that you want to talk about uh, the risk that uh, the measures taken in order to face the pandemic can create a certain, let's say, dynamics of, uh, about the individual freedoms. But I cannot accept that democracy has been a victim of the pandemic. In the cases of Poland and Hungary, it has already been a decision from the Commission with respect to Poland, and it's under study of the services of the Commission, the reaction that we have to take with respect to Hungary. And I want to say clearly that the European Union will remain a democratic union based on the respect of the rule of law and democratic values, and this is going to be with pandemic or without pandemic. Can it be a democratic union if one of its member states is no longer considered a democracy? To be considered as a democracy is something that belongs to the uh, Commission and the Council and the European Parliament case by case. And as far as I know, no European member state has been considered as a non-democratic country.